Thank you. I, I shortened it to the Dear Dan's phenomenon. <laughs> so, <laughs> would have been easier to say. Thanks, um, Jeff, uh, for your presentation. The last um, paragraph that sort of um, leads nicely uh, into my presentation. So I'm really glad I'm just <coughs> right after you. <laughs> um, I've changed my paper somewhat um, into a more oral presentation and uh, reflecting on some uh, of yesterday's discussion, uh, it's quite different from um, what you may have read. Um, but I, I hope it will make sense. Um, okay, let's get started here. The deer dance, as practiced by indigenous peoples in northwestern Mexico, is a phenomenon that has attracted considerable attention since it was, since it was first um, uh, documented by 19th century foreign scientists and travelers who were interested in a region for entrepreneurial reasons. By the mid 20th century, ethnographies had become some, somewhat more edifying as they contained more detailed descriptions uh, of the observed phenomenon, replicating the then common belief in scientific objectivity. The detailed description of the deer dance by Rolf Beals, a pioneer of modern Mexican ethnography, largely corresponds with today's practice practices among Yaqui and Yoremi communities. <laughs> Ethnographer David Schwarter holds that, quote, all of the ethnographic literature as well as the fieldwork that I carried out among the UAMIM, Yakis, suggests that deer dancing is associated with hunting as a means of securing appropriate relations with the animal and plant world, especially the deer, and concludes that, quote, deer dancing as a pre hunting ritual demonstrates UAMI deer reciprocity and an acknowledgement of their mutual sacrifice. Shorter's main uh, informant, Felipe Molina, a native deer singer who served as governor of Yoen Pueblo, Arizona, and a member of the Pasco Tribal Council, had already collaborated with Larry Evers, professor of English at the University of Arizona, on a book called Yaqui Deer Songs, a Native American Poetry, published in 1987. Evers and Molina interpreted the deer dance as, quote, a gathering, a gathering the wilderness world into a symbol of earthly sacrifice and of spiritual life after death. Responses, uh, responses uh, ceremonies hold for this disease, such as you saw uh, just on this video here, is just one of the many occasions when deer dances are performed. It largely remains a matter of whether you believe in any of these interpretations or not. Um, it is not my intention to give yet another interpretation. However, the Yoremi story about twin brothers becoming venado hombre, dear man, I found very interesting. That story was collected by the Mexican anthropologist Angel Ochoa Sasueta, who was searching for the tribe's origins of, or, origin or creation myths. Curiously, Ochoa did not work with this story, even though, in my view, uh, it contains the seed for understanding the deer dance phenomenon. So let's first situate the Yoreme uh, on this map here. This vast territory of what is today northwest Mexico was populated by hunter-gatherers and estimated 30,000 to 15,000 years before the present. The fertile soil of the alluvial plains formed by the depositions of sediments from the periodic floodings of the uh, river running down, um, the, the many rivers here running down from the Sierra Madre Occidental uh, towards the Gulf of California 
um, attracted early human settlements dedicated to horticulture. The Yoreme are one of many uh, ma of uh, the many ethnic groups of Mexico. They are related to the Yaqui uh, here in Sonora and Arizona, and the Tarahumara here in the um, in uh, the mountains of Chihuahua. Um, they, uh, their language belongs to the Utaztecan language uh, family, which is, uh, means they are uh, linguistically related uh, to the Nahua, uh, the former Aztecs. Uh, my fieldwork uh, concentrated along the Fuerte River in northern Sila Sinaloa here in this area. Uh, the rock blower mountains along the foot of the Sierra Madre, an arid region referred to as Monte or Mountain, or in Yoreme language, Huyanya, the natural world, considered uh, the world of sensation, the enchanted world from where all life originated. Spanish explorers and Jesuit missionaries entered the land and life of the Yoreme's ancestors in the late 16th century. Ensuing cultural, social, political, and economic clashes loomed throughout the colonial period post-independence and the 20th century. One of the most contentious issues was the economic development of the fertile Yaqui Mayo Valleys. Occasional Indian uprising and attacks on the encroaching settlers in the Sonora, Sinaloa provinces and the final defeat of the Yaqui in 1929 by the Mexican army bespeak the highly asymmetrical relations of power. Many of the characteristics of this contact zone continue today. In this century, the Yoreme will be additionally challenged by the question of how to negotiate their cultural identity in the face of an ever accelerating agricultural expansion, unsustainable agri agribusiness practices, and environment policies that further impoverish their communities and an environmental degradation that endangers their very lives as well as the lives of other beings that inhabit the region. The increase in Sinaloa's export oriented agriculture, relying heavily on fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, irrigation water, and cheap labor, has enriched multinational corporations at the expense of small subsistence, subsistence farmers. Uh, <clears throat> the intensified agricultural production attracts thousands of seasonal laborers from other parts of Mexico who join the local workforce, many of whom are drafted from indigenous communities. As I mentioned before, we know of Tiran Pascola dances from 19th century and early 20th century foreign scientists uh, that uh, show deer dance and Pascola dances such as this one by the French naturalist and explorer Léon Diguet, taken around 1896, a portrait of a Yaqui group in Baja California uh, consisting of a deer dancer, uh, a masked Pascola dancer and the musicians, a harp player, violin player, uh, the... Um, a drum flute player and the three uh, uh, singers uh, with the two rasps, uh, rasping sticks and the water drum. Uh, this uh, published photo is mislabeled as Wichol uh, Indians. Um, the deer dancer with the naked upper torso indicates that it's actually a, um, a yaki uh, deer dancer. And here uh, you have the comparison of a contemporary yaki deer dancer with the naked upper torso and uh, the yoreme deer dancer uh, that uh, is fully dressed. The earliest known photographic evidence of the deer dancer I've been able to find is this studio photograph, a commercial carte de visite, taken around 1870, and erroneously titled Yaki Deer Dancer. It shows a Yoremi deer, a Yoremi deer dancer wearing a pascola belt uh, here with his uh, bells, um, instead of uh, what he would wear, uh, a belt with uh, deer hooves. In any case, here I'm interested in the upper part of this figure. figure. The man, the deer, and the flower. Um, flower uh, in Yoreme means segua, and man or native uh, yoreme. That's why they call themselves yoreme and not mayo as uh, they are labeled by the Mexican government. Um, the flower segua, native or man yoreme, man flower is a combination, a word combination that we um, that is very often used in the cantos interchangeably with deer. Segua yoleme means deer. These figurative relations, however, should not be understood as metaphoric. As described elsewhere, the relationship between the concepts of flower, deer, and man is metonymic. This metonymy, according to Gary Tomlinson, quote, is not a connection of part to whole, but rather the contact of proximate aspects of the world, in contrast to the relations across distance struck up in metaphor. 
end quote. Uh, it is a me me metonymy that collapses into sameness, as explained by my long Yoreme acquaintance, Bernardo Esquer, in the following manner. I translate, the first humans, Yolemem, originated from the flower, segua. That's why the deer is called segua yoleme, flor indigena, native flower, hombre flor, native man flower. Although I had attended numerous sermons on various occasions, it was not until some years into my fieldwork that I finally grasped the meaning of this holistic mode of perception. In, 2000 and, uh, in 2008, I went to a paico, a fiesta, a pascola ceremony in the Centro Seminal in the Rio of um, uh, um, Cinco de Mayo in Los Mochis, northern Sinaloa, where Vicente Limon, uh, this man here, an accomplished deer dancer, had been invited to perform or to participate. The ceremony had started in the morning with a few onlookers only, so I took the opportunity to approach the dancer to take still photographs in daylight, by daylight. Upon showing Limon the photograph some days later, he looked at me rather perplexed. He did not remember seeing me at the ceremony. Having been the only person present with a camera at hand, so that was 2008, um, no cell phones at that time, and encroaching the ritual space to take close-ups, his reaction puzzled me. When I told other acquaintances, they pointed to the photograph. Look at his eyes, they said. He does not see with his own eyes. He sees through the eyes of the deer. He has become the animal, the animal, segua yoleme. I couldn't help being reminded of Hannah Arendt's words, how strange that we have to see in order to take for real what we cannot see. Let me make a side comment here. I think it is crucial to check uh, English translations of, in this case, the original German text to better understand its meaning. This quote from a letter to Heidegger, which Arndt wrote from New York in 1971, Wie seltsam, dass wir sehen müssen, um das wahrzunehmen, was wir nicht sehen können. I translated the word wahrnehmen literally to take for real, instead of the ambiguous term to perceive, which was used in the English edition. <coughs> Because if we wish to understand the deer dance phenomenon, we must take seriously the truth claim that Yoremi make based on their perception. Not in the sense of trying to enter their minds, but rather following Merleau-Ponty's advice in order to see the world and to grasp it as paradoxical, we must break with our familiar acceptance of it. Phenomenology, to quote Merleau-Ponty again, as a philosophy which puts essence back into existence and does not accept to arrive at an understanding of man and the world from any other starting point, uh, from, from any starting point other than that of their facticity, end of quote, calls for considering existence not as a given, but as something that human beings come to. Existence, hence, is not a passive dwelling in the world, but rather a distinctive manner in which we belong in the world. It is Dasein in a Heideggerian sense of living out our possibilities. Heidegger's philosophical thinking is shaped in the German language, and I believe it's not possible to understand Heidegger without looking into his analysis of etymology of the terms that he's using. So, Dasein is usually translated as being there, often uh, used as being in the field, equivalent with Anwesenheit, being there, rather than with existence in the sense of something that one can come to. So, not existence as a given. Um, the German terms, uh, term uh, Wesen is customarily translated as essence and Anwesenheit, as I said, as, as presence. These conventional translations, however, are misleading. Heidegger exploits the etymology, etymological features of these terms, which are, I think, impossible to retain in translation, but which point to his understanding of them as dynamic. Um, Wesen, according to Heidegger, has a verbal origin that derives from the, from the high German word Wesen, which is the same as Wären, to last, and means bleiben, to remain, to linger, or more specifically then as a noun, bleibendes Weilen, lingering whiling. Um, that's uh, um, the, best, <laughs> the best translation I, I, I could find for uh, Wesen. Wesen uh, is related to the verb sein, to be, uh, although it is only um, preserved in the form of gewesen, I've, I've been, um, ich bin gewesen. Anwesen is the derivative of Wesen. Heidegger identifies Anwesen with Ankommen, to arrive, and with Angehen, uh, 
um, to concern, to approach, uh, and uncommon, to arrive, uh, eventually to get at, finding access. Uh, this is not a word play. Uh, it's the foundation of his philosophical thinking anchored in a very precise language. Being as becoming is also Einsicht zeigen, uh, showing itself or oneself. The things that show themselves or appear to us are the things we perceive, or um, uh, as I pointed out before, the things that we take for real from the German word wahrnehmen. Our perception depends on our positioning in the world. We are all aware of the fact that we cannot see or perceive the world as it is seen, as it is seen through the eyes of Segua Yolemme, the flower dear man. But maybe phenomenology can show us a way out of this dilemma because life is always being in a world with one another. We are never simply faced with other li um, living beings, but transposed into their environment. Heidegger developed this idea in his 1951 lecture, Building Dwelling Thinking, using the term wohnen, dwelling, inhabiting, place making, uh, to capture the distinctive manner in which we belong in the world. Tim Ingold added to Heidegger's ontological considerations the social and ecological domains of being with, arguing that humans are brought into existence as organisms, persons within a world that is inhabited by beings of manifold kinds, both human and non-human. I would like to use these ideas to reflect not on the deer dance, but on fieldwork in particular on my early fieldwork experience. As I said, our perception depends on how we position ourselves in the world, on our attitude or Einstellung toward the thing world, the reflexive verb of sich auf etwas einstellen, um, to prepare oneself for something. Again, Heidegger is building on a different meaning of, uh, of, a, of, on, of uh, on different meanings of a word, in this, in this case, stellen, uh, to put or to place, to develop his philosophical reflections on Dasein, being in the world. Doing fieldwork means to place oneself into the world, to embrace the world. It is based on lived experience. It is sentient and intuitive. Most of all, it requires to change our position and to take up a different perspective. I'm now literally changing perspective, reflecting on a view that is much closer to the earth. Um, my two and a half year old uh, daughters uh, talking about the deer shortly before a ceremony was about to begin. And you will notice in the video, it's, it's um, not of very good quality because it's taken in 2004, but you can notice that it was a spontaneous interaction they involved me into while I was videotaping the sensorial saturated pre-ceremonial setting uh, on this uh, video. It's the kitchen where they prepare the food for uh, the, um, here's the harp uh, player waiting. And I will hear my daughter. When I heard her talk about the little deer, um, I switched the camera. And my other daughter then explaining the deer to me, the big little deer. Um, at um, their very first attendance uh, of a ceremony some time earlier, they observed the dancer lower his uh, deer headdress toward the water drum, apparently mm -hmm. to drink from the liquid. One of them immediately called out to warn the little deer um, to not drink from the dirty water because it would make it sick. And it's, uh, as its mom had told me, so I sort of heard my own voice uh, there um, to not drink from, from uh, any water. Because they were thrown into a world that was largely familiar to them, sitting and playing in the dirt, they intuitively understood that world. Whereas my pre-understandings, prejudices resulting from my many years of inculturation in a different world hindered me uh, to grasp the truthfulness of man becoming deer. To them, the dancer was the deer. Um, three years later, still playing uh, in the dirt, 
Um, uh, they made decorative figures with seeds from the uh, Alamo uh, tree during, uh, to pass uh, the, the time during lengthy ceremonies. And I only discovered their earthly perception when browsing my photo archive a couple of weeks ago uh, to prepare for this presentation. So I found this uh, photograph again. Um, and I started to compare it with uh, other uh, photographs that I've taken. This uh, from a Pascola dancer um, that uh, his, you can see his footprints here, the, the, the circle, the spiral um, that he leaves, so it's a performative. And here, um, these are um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Las Labras on Sinaloa's shoreline rock carvings. Uh, they were made between 2500 BC and 1200 AD, possibly by shams to represent visions seen during their trances. So uh, that motive um, um, is uh, showing up there as well. Um, getting back uh, is my last example um, to uh, the Segua Yolani again. What is the relation of these apparently different but linked ob ob objects to the world? Why is it so difficult for us to see the sameness of man, flower, and deer beyond the metaphorical and symbolical? Um, it has to be pointed out that the concepts of man, flower, and deer not, are not always linked. Rather, it is through momentary relational engagements between persons and things during the ceremonial fiesta that the deer dancer is able of becoming deer. Relationality, Amy Whitehead holds, quote, operates from the basic assumptions that all persons, human persons, statue persons, such an on this picture, plant and animal persons, etc., are equal and equally capable of drawing one another into being in moments of active um, relating, and from the unique properties or perspectives of their bodies, whether deliberate, spontaneous, or imminent. Thus, in accordance with phenomenological inquiry, our concern is not a question of how we encounter things in the world, but about how, uh, how our directing ourselves towards things brings about their appearance. Yoremi people direct themselves towards things in a, a bodily way. During Holy Week, the statue of Jesus is attended to by the women in the community. They clean and dress the statue. It's being carried around the village during processions. It's being hidden by the community, captured by Pilate's henchmen, arrested, incarcerated, crucified, and buried under flowers. That whole day, people enter the church to touch the flowers and the body buried underneath. <clears throat> As... Uh, they have uh, the day before the Jesus statue carrying the cross, some shedding tears upon seeing Christ's suffering. So the touching is a, a very uh, important aspect here, how they um, relate uh, to those um, uh, figures. When the church was empty, I asked my children to pose with the statue for a photo. One of them at first furiously refused, telling me that Jesus made her sick. Inquiring why, why that was so, she explained in Swiss German, I translate, everyone is touching him, leaving their germs on him, so that when I touch him, I get sick. The one word um, she, she said in this conversation in English was the word germs. Uh, because she had learned during the few months they had attended kindergarten in the U.S. prior to accompanying me into the field to Mexico, that germs made people sick. It was the beginning of rational thinking and arguing. The age she began to lose her earthly perception and build prejudices according to the world uh, in, in, uh, in which she um, began to become enculturated. So, this is my last example. And. Thank you.